thank you very, very much. Councillor Fran Mann? Nope. Harold Payton? Jason Devitt? This list is getting really short, eh? <laughs> and Gary Campbell, Director of Sustainability and External Relations, North Queensland Bob Ports. Thank you very much. And Bernadette Hogan, Acting Director, Reef Partnerships Office of the Great Barrier Reef. Thank you very much. I know Bernadette's here, we've met before, I saw her earlier. So thank you very, very much for, uh, for joining us. And um, at this point in time, uh, we will wait for the Mayor to come up and have his little discussion when he does arrive. But however, uh, I'm going to move right along with our program and invite uh, the Chair, Julie Boyd, to step forward and uh, give us a bit of an introduction and welcome and uh, what this is all about. Thank you very much, Julie. Thanks, Kerry, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the Commission on Sun for letting me be today and uh, uh, you know, really thank for their, their involvement over the period of time we've been there has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's great that all councils are all here because then I don't have to go through the list of dignitaries apart from obviously the couple that are here. And um, you know, but we're, I think we're all here as dignitaries because this is really the partners who come together and continue to come together. One of the things that Kerry said is in 2014 when I was here, um, but in wearing a different hat entirely rather than being involved in the partnership, wearing a different hat being involved in the resource industry network, and uh, he had a sign at that uh, 2014 event. And I'd have to say at the time, I thought to myself, well, this is a great initiative, love it, but how are we really going to get people to stick together and stay together over the long haul? Because it's all very well to get the initial data, it's all very well to get the initial excitement, but unless you can get people to continue to be involved and invest, it actually will risk naught in the long run. So it is really quite remarkable and a testament to all the partners that they have, in fact, continued to and commit to it. And five years later, about 80% of the partners are still members of the partnership, which is fantastic. So the, um, and the, you know, I, I think that part of that also is to do with the staff, because the staff have really put in the work, and they have actually made sure that we keep the information going. The two-way two street of the flow of information has been just fantastic. We've actually got a couple of new partners um, joined us last year. Um, we had Catchment Solutions, who are here, um, and Eco Barge Clean Seas, so uh, who joined the partnership last year. The Whit Sunday Charter Boat Industry Association rejoined, as did the Mackay Conservation Group. So it was good to have them back in the tent and being a part of the conversation. Um, and in 2019-20, even though we're only a month into it, we've already got our first new partner, and that is the Queensland Water and Land Carers. And uh, they really approached us and were very keen to be involved, so which is uh, which I think is really quite uh, significant. And not only have they joined here, but they've joined a couple of partnerships up the north as well. So they really see that their involvement is key to being um, a part of uh, the partnerships going forward. I'm going to acknowledge somebody who's just walked into the room because um, the newest member of the partnership, but Charlie Morgan's just to work out. So it wasn't there, I just thought, you know, other important people. So one of the things that um, uh, you know we do when we welcome new industry and community groups into the partnership is to really just talk to them about what their mutual benefit is. And we really looked at well, who else should be involved in this? And we're starting to try and reach out and talk to other industries that we think would have a prime involvement in it. And we want, want people to be to invest in it, but also to get something out of it. So that many of the partners are providing scientific um, information, which goes into the uh, report card. But we're also looking at those people who can't necessarily sit around the table and participate on a, on a meeting basis. But they're interested, they want to know, they want information from us. And so we've actually um, set up a new membership category this time, which is called Supporter. So it's provided a new logo, we're looking at some new photo stock, some information we can provide to people. And so they have become a, a supporter of the partnership rather than being a partner per se. So we know that there are people who are interested in that. So if you know businesses, organisations, groups of like, that you think could benefit from it, then please let us know because we would actually like to include them in our support and side group. I think the thing about it is the more we can get the information out there, the more people actually understand what the partnership does, what the report card does, why we have it, 
the more people we can actually engage and change their hearts and minds about what we need to do. The report card, as we know, is based on very good social science. Um, it brings a whole lot of information in a wide range of existing programs, including some of our partners. And the data from these programs is used to produce the report card and the scores. I'd really like to acknowledge two people who put in a huge amount of work for the last six months, um, pulling all of that together, and that's Alicia and Jess, who have provided hours and hours and hours of work of pulling that data together. So well done to you too for actually for doing that, because I think when you sort of see the kind of, oh yes, we've got so much work on, we can't look at these other things, and you're thinking, oh, really, seriously, you've been doing this for months. But when you actually look at the report card, <laughs> and you look at the data that comes in, you think, yeah, now I know why they're all pulling their hair out and uh, coming down to that last bit. So uh, thank you to you too. It's been, it's been really quite fantastic um, getting this report card out. And this is the first time it's been out four months in advance. So that's not an easy thing to do when you look at the data that goes in behind that. The science, as I said, is rigorous and um, there's a review process that's been undertaken with the technical working group, the independent science panel. And um, I'd like to thank some of the people from the technical working group um, I don't know that um, they're here, some of the people aren't here, but Judith Wake from CQU, Ken Murray from DNRME, Nicola Stokes from NQDP, Bernie Kirkane, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, it's probably not, um, DNRME, Phil Trendle from DAF, Luke Gaylor from the Council, and Chris Dentry and Ruth Catchman. All these people involved in the technical working group to make sure that in fact the information we provide is, um, is spot on and is rigorous. Um, I'd also like to actually thank Di Tart, who has been chair before me. I've been in this role for 12 months. Di Tart was the chair, the inaugural chair, and um, she uh, stepped down, but she's now taken on the role up at Dry Coffee, so she's now leading that um, new uh, partnership and that new report card. So I'd like to acknowledge Di and the work that she did, because for, for somebody who wasn't based locally, she really put in a lot of effort and made sure that the, the science, the information, the processes that we had in place we were absolutely spot on, so I'd really like to thank John for that. So what's new in the report card? You'll hear a lot more from other people shortly. But um, I, as I said, the time lag, the data has been brought forward by, by three or four months, which has been just really quite remarkable, because one of the things people often say is, well, it's 2018 data, we're halfway through 2019, what are we doing? Um, but when you think about the work that goes on to actually produce that data and get the scores together, uh, it is really quite fantastic. Um, we've got uh, water quality scores in both the Northern Inshore and the Southern Inshore signs have been uh, produced for the first time in the Southern Inshore sign. And I'd like to thank um, the ongoing sponsors for that to actually make that happen. Um, we've also got more comprehensive assessment this time of the pesticides in the freshwater basins and the marine inshore signs. Um, we've updated the Indigenous cultural and heritage shirt, including the assessment of Cape Palmerston for the first time. And the community perceptions assessment, the first time. Um, Part has been the report card for the first time since the report card. The first report card, get that right, yeah. The community perceptions assessment is for the first time since the report card. Um, you're going to hear more about, as I said, the other um, uh, from the other areas of the report card. But I think we had Cyclone Debbie uh, two years ago. That is still impacting our waterways and our water health. Uh, and um, one of the things we're going to be doing this time around is in about three or four months' time. We're going to launch another report card. And this is about the management response. So what are people doing? What's happening in our region? Where does the investment need to go? What are the things that actually will make the difference? How do we change the hearts and minds of the of people who live within this region, of government and others to invest appropriately? So we really don't, we have this fantastic science, great data, but what are we doing with it? The so what question. So we've got all the information, so what are you doing with it? And that's a question that media asks all the time. So we're really looking forward to having, having that happen. Emma has been in the role for the last uh, six months um, as the executive officer. And, um, and I think that uh, and she's done a fantastic job stepping into Charlie's boots. She and Charlie are going to work sort of side by side going forward in another uh, couple of months, weeks' time. But I think that one of the things about that is that, and Emma's really got behind that whole process. So we're so um, you know, uh, passionately, because I think that we talked about it, we know we've got the information, now what are we actually going to do with it? So I'd like to thank Emma um, for the effort that she's put into that and her ongoing work. And I know that over the next um, you know, three or four months, it's going to be heads down for all the team to make sure that we actually can get that management report out. We hope to have seen you back here at that particular time. 
and he's the news of art as well. So <laughs> perfect timing. So thank you very much for coming on this morning. Um, thank you for your continuing involvement, and um, I look forward to seeing um, everyone here back in maybe early October when we do our management report response. So thank you. Julie, and uh, it's great having Julie's leadership in, in the role of chair. And I think that it, the added value is the fact that Julie is also the chair of reef catchments, uh, which dovetails into the work and the efforts that we're making on the ground across the region and not just in the reporting phases. So I'd like to thank Julie again because it's important <laughs> that we have somebody local who's connected in so many ways to where we need to be and where we are today. At this point in time, I'd like to invite Meg Reg Williamson to the stand to uh, probably give us a welcome. I know that he's been pushed for time, but uh, thank you very, very much, Meg, for making the time available. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my apologies for being a little bit tardy. We had a news conference sprung on us at the last moment by the Minister Craig Crawford today about the release of the iGEM report into the last round of bushfires that we had. I said, well, I've got to be out here by 10. Oh, yes, we'll get that out of the number, no problems. But you know when politicians start talking? <laughs> and just, uh, it's hard to pull them up. So somebody said Channel 7 should be here. No, they're not. They're still there with him. So hopefully they'll, uh, they'll come. Chen and Julie, it's uh, great to see you here today. Chen, it's good to see you with your youngster here today as well. 50 years of celebrations in this last uh, week or so about mankind uh, going to the moon 50 years ago. And when you think of the tremendous vision and passion and drive and technological advancements that were involved in this world, particularly in the United States, of course, but put, putting a man on the moon. And still today, we are faced with so many environmental challenges that we've not applied that technology, that drive and that passion to as we should have as a human race. So that's why this sort of an event is very, very important. And when I've reflected on the past week and a half, just the things that I've uh, been to, I attended the uh, Asia Pacific Cities Summit in Brisbane, where 80 mayors from around the Asia Pacific were gathered and one of the, the major topics was sustainability and environment. And we had a young 14 year old called the Plastic Free Boy present as one of the panels of keynotes. And his, his presentation was just riveting. I'd hate to come up against him when he's 34. <laughs> uh, but it was riveting in, in that he is driving a message to Australian school children around keeping the plastics out of our oceans. And that message of 8 million tonnes of plastic ending up in the oceans and possibly in a, in a, in a turtle's gullet, well, I mean, one turtle, but in, in a turtle's gullet every year, what we are doing to the environment, it, it really riveted the room. There were 1,300 delegates and I guess every one of them was, was, it was you could have heard a pin drop for this young, young guy saying, we have to do something about it as a community. We have to do something about it as a human race. And then just a, a few days ago, we launched at, uh, at Caneland an artistic representation of what is happening in our, in our oceans and what's washing out of our creeks and streams into our oceans where a giant whale was, uh, was launched in Caneland, which was made out of plastic bags, used plastic bags that's been gathered from our waste areas. And the week before that, we launched just in the, in the, the council's ground there, uh, a, a program that had young school children and a lot of other community people sorting through the rubbish that comes out of the 200 traps we have in our drainage systems in Mackay before to try and trap stuff before it goes into the Pioneer River or the other creeks and streams. And the rubbish that came out of that was just amazing to behold. You know, why are we doing this? 
So this report card, this report card of healthy rivers to reef environmental aspects is extremely important for us. It's extremely important for us to get the message out that we need report cards like this. We need to focus on our rivers and our streams. We are doing things really well in our community, but there's a lot more we could do. When you look at the report card, you see 17 of our areas have actually remained the same. Four or five have gone up, and three have gone down. And so those are, we, we need to have this sort of focus annually. I know this only comes out every two years, but annually we need to have this sort of focus because it's inherent in everything we do to make sure that the environment that we live in, that we are so proud of, that produces the agriculture that delivers a third of Australia's sugar, that produces the agriculture that delivers a, uh, a cattle industry worth half a billion dollars annually to us, that produces the fabulous beaches that we've got here. We need to protect all of that. We need to ensure that as a community, we are doing the most we can to deliver a healthy environment because it's in all of our best interests. So congratulations on this report card. It, it adds to the fabric of what we are as a community. And I hope that, uh, you know, we continue to, that's a whole lot, Charlie. But, <laughs> I, I hope that we continue as a community to focus on the things that make us stronger. And together, as a strong community, we will, we will provide for our children what that young 14-year-old guy was telling us at, uh, at that conference, a future that they can be proud of. Thanks for being here. Thank you very, very much, Greg. And uh, poignant words that we all need to take note of and take on board. I'd like to, uh, just to we skip right through now. We're almost drinking a full tank already. Whitney Churchill from DVCT is going to uh, make a short address to us now. Uh, Dally Bay, Old Town Middle representative, Rick Ricky is. They've been part of the foundation since 2014. Ricky's been part of, as Rick in September became the deputy chair of 2018. And uh, so not only is DVCT volunteering to be a part of the partnership, be part of the meetings, but also the additional time and effort to be part of the executive team of the, of the partnership in the deputy chair role. And it's not one of those token roles. I'm certainly sure that Emma makes sure that the chair, the deputy chair, the executive three or four earn their cup of tea and a biscuit. <laughs> and uh, we as partners see the results of those meetings through their efforts and the outcomes that we see when we come together as partners. So um, Ricky and DBCT have been instrumental in advocacy for and funding of the Southern Inshore Monitoring Program that has been running in the Southern Inshore Zone of the report card since 2017. The first grades for this zone released in the 2018 report card. This is critical. We had so many silo, silo monitoring systems. Until we got the Healthy Rivers to Reef partnership together, we were able to identify monitoring that was occurring in different groups and bringing the data together to get a quick and greater picture, now we have an understanding. We'd like to thank the VCT and all those that have now participated in drawing this monitoring together so we have a clearer picture of where we are and where we can go. So I'd like to introduce Ricky to the us at you. There's actually two coal terminals down at Hay Point. Darrinkle Bay Coal Terminal is the larger of the two facilities. And BMA, I'd like to acknowledge Pete, who's also here in the audience with Amanda, um, put a coal terminal right next door to us. We work extremely closely. We also work with NQDP. Darrinkle Bay Coal Terminal, last financial year, put through 69 million tonnes of coal which loaded 693 ships for overseas export. This coal all came from the Bowen Basin and 85% of that coal was coking coal, which is used to manufacture steel. 
As Kerry said, Darren the Bay Coal Terminal Proprietary Limited are a proud financial partner of the Mackay with Sunday Healthy Rivers Tariq Partnership. We've actively contributed to the production and development of the report cards since 2015. We're committed to working collaboratively with all the partners in the room so that the region has robust, scientific, publicly available data on our waterways and the ecosystem health. In 2017, the partnership identified a knowledge gap in the southern inshore zone. This demonstrated a lack of long-term information on the condition of water quality, coral, seagrass and fish off the coast of Carmilla. One of the objectives of the partnership is to continually improve the report card by developing and filling these, these identified data gaps. By filling these gaps, we intend to ensure that long-term information is available to understand where the condition of habitats is improving, stable or in decline, and in turn, where the management action is needed. Funding from Darifle Bay Coal Terminal Proprietary Limited enabled both the 2017 reconnaissance and baseline surveys, and then the 2018 monitoring to be undertaken which is reported in the report card today. I didn't get to go on those reconnaissance trips. One of my enviros did and loved the helicopter ride. <laughs> Next year, I'm putting my hand up. <laughs> this financial year, we've also partnered with our terminal asset owner, DBCT Management, to ensure the ongoing funding of this program at the Southern Inshore Zone. We are really proud to see that the continued funding of the monitoring at this site is leading towards better understanding of waterway health and the ecosystem condition in the southern inshore zone, especially as it's an important area for our dugongs. And we look forward to continuing our active participation in the partnership to bring you more results in next year's report card. Monitoring is so much more important, I think, and we've got Tony Vijaya here is one of our leading growers who's been very active on his farm and a lot of what he develops. But he will also know that as growers, we have a greater belief in monitoring, real-time monitoring, so we see real results rather than desktop modelling based on another model. What we've been able to see through the partnership is an improvement in the actual monitoring that's occurring across our region, rather than models on models. Because models on models work on the old principle of garbage in, garbage out. Good information in, good information out. But sometimes the modeling gets a bit, gets a bit wavered. So we have a greater belief in monitoring. And also, I think for the government, both federal and state, they have a greater understanding of where we're coming from and we can produce real-time monitoring. And that's important. So thank you very, very much. And when we want to get all this monitoring, we want to know what's going on out there. We also need to look and find out a little bit more. We hear from our wreck fishers often about, about what water's like out there and what the reef looks like. <coughs> all that's going on out there. And in the, in the partnership, one person who's really a quiet, looks in violet in the corner and tells us little or nothing about <coughs> what's going on in the recreational fishing space um, is Luke. Luke Gallia, who is, uh, is from the Thai Regional Council. He's the supervisor of waterways team at Council. He's been the Council's representative on Healthy Rivers to Reef Partnership since 2015. And is also a regional member of the Technical Working Group. He works with all things waterway, even when he's not fishing. Um, <laughs> related with construction, maintenance of fishways, water sensitive urban design, uh, management, erosion and sediment control and building regional wetlands and from the Facebook posts that I've seen, he's a really good fisherman as well. <laughs> it, doesn't, it, it doesn't mind going out and checking the waterways and the health of the reef at every opportunity <coughs> along with other Makai recreational fishermen. I'd like to invite Luke to not take you with me. <laughs> Very much, Kerry, for that introduction. 
Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we meet today. I'd like to pay my respects to the leaders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the Corrigal Council Mayor, Greg Williamson, Partnership Chair, Julie Boyd, councillors, colleagues and members of the partnership. The amount of VIPs here today certainly depicts to me the importance of the subject matter at hand. Well, there's one surefire way to bribe me into making a speech, is to tell me I can talk about fish. <laughs> As many people would know, I don't need too many excuses for this, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to informing you what the Coalition and Council are doing in this space very shortly. In all honesty though, it excites me immensely the native freshwater fish information is being captured in the Public Sunday Healthy Rivers to Reef forecard. Given Mackay's high boat ownership per capita and the fact that a large proportion of our community actually fish, this information is going to be of particular relevance, be of particular relevance, sorry, and interest to many, myself included. Community health grades in the freshwater basins have been updated for the first, first time since the 2015 report card. For the first time ever, this includes the great fish communities in the Proserpine Basin. For the Proserpine, O'Connell, Pioneer and Plain Basins, the grades were a combination of A's, which is very good, obviously, and B's, which is good. Which demonstrates at the basin level, our regions, creeks and rivers are rich in native fish. And pest fish were found in only low numbers when considering the entire oh. basin. Now, this does not mean we do not have pest fish. In, in some of our local waterways, or can afford to take our foot off the pedal in terms of education, awareness, or mitigation measures such as electric fishing surveys, pest fishing days, education, or habitat works. It means that at the moment they are in restricted areas. We want to keep it that way. It is vitally important that we do all we can to prevent pest fish entering other waterways in the Kiowa Sunday region. Now, pest fish like tilapia are well known in waterways close to Mackay City Centre and other more urbanised waterways throughout the region, including Bowen. Tilapia can aggressively compete with native fish species that dominate waterways. Tilapia can also degrade in-stream habitats through their nest building activities, which muddies the waters and uproots aquatic vegetation. Events like the annual Tilapia Fishing Day at the Goose Ponds and Mackay Regional Council and Reef Catchments help to coordinate raises the community's awareness of this pest fish. This is always a great community event. In fact, I think we had about 300 people there this year. It's fantastic. Now, electric fishing surveys that contribute to the data for this 2018 report card, um, community health scores, were actually undertaken in October 2017, which was just prior to the time another nasty was discovered in the Mackay region, the peacock bass. Now, this information pertaining to this fish, peacock bass, will become more evident in the next report card. And peacock bass, they're nasty. They are the race predators native to the Amazon catchment. If they become established in the region, they have the potential to decimate our wild barramundi population within a short time. They are a real threat. These fish have been imported into Australia for the aquarium trade and are now widely sold. Peacock bass actually are a bucket list fish for recreational fishermen from around the world. So the release of these fish into the Kyle waterways has likely been done by a very small minority of ill-informed Ill recreational fishermen who wanted to catch one of these fish, not realising the implications for our barramundi and our hosts of other native fish. Now, electrofishing surveys to gauge the extent of the incursions have been commissioned by the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries um, and supported in kind by council. Now, this is a good first step, but in my opinion, more needs to be done to slow the ease of accessibility of these fish for purchase. Otherwise, we could literally spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on eradication programs, monitoring electrofishing, only for some unscrupulous individual to purchase another dozen fish tomorrow, throw them back in the water. Now, supporting the local native fish species is one of MRC's priorities, and we're quite active in this space. Keeping with the initial theme of the goose ponds, Council have invested considerable resources here by contributing to the installation of 20 log hotels at four locations throughout the ponds. The purpose of undertaking habitat improvement was to increase resource availability for native fish species, thereby building resilience and allowing greater competition for the unwanted pest fish mentioned earlier. The Council have also installed a series of aeration devices in the most upstream pond of the goose ponds to mitigate against low oxygen induced fish kills. I'm pleased to say that despite small fish kills occurring in the pools further downstream, there have been no reported fish kills in the pool with the devices in them. 
indicating to me they may well be doing a reasonable job. And I've already mentioned Council's involvement with the annual Tilapia Best Fishing Day at Goose Ponds. Now, MRC have designed, constructed, and maintained 22 fishways in their local government area. Fishways are critical pieces of infrastructure that allow for the upstream migration of many recreational and commercially important fish species barramundi, mangrove jack, and sea mullet, just to name a few. In fact, in 2018-19, uh, financial year just gone, Council built fishways on Leela Creek, Nadawi Creek, Porter's Road, which is on the O'Connell River, as well as underwent some major repairs to Landing Road Fishway down at Rocky Dam Creek and Forbes Road Fishway, also on the O'Connell River. We also undertook detailed design of the major fishway on Jollymont Creek, which feeds into our net free zone. The Jollymont Creek Fishway is currently being constructed this financial year out of what works for Queensland funding and is worth $300,000 alone. It represents the largest fishway we've ever built, so I'm pretty excited about that. Now, in speaking of net free zone, Council have supported a voluntary code of conduct created by the Mackay Recreation Fishers Alliance, fish, recreational fishermen who fish within this zone. This voluntary code of conduct is an outstanding example of environmental stewardship by recreational fishermen who know how fortunate we are to have this zone on our doorstep and do what we can to look after it. This aligns perfectly with Council's recreational fishing strategy and has also created, that has also been created, sorry, as does the 194 artificial reef structures we have installed recently at a Kinchin Dam in order to improve the region's fishing and tourist potential. Of course, with fishing, um, you know, of course, fish and improving habitat and two parts are two parts of the management story. The other is improving water quality. Council is also active in installing gross pollutant traps to capture litter in our CBD that the Mayor touched on earlier, maintaining bioretention bases and constructed wetlands for urban stormwater quality runoff. Um, undertaking vegetation planting projects like National Tree Day next week, by the way, and even investing in on-farm sediment and nutrient management practices. The Coalition Council has been a strong supporter of, the, of this partnership since its inception in 2014. We believe that this is a very worthwhile venture for our council to be a part of and play an active role in, and we'll continue to be environmental stewards through our internal projects and operations. In closing, I just want to congratulate the Executive Officer and ladies on the team, Charlie, Emma, Alicia and Jess for a fantastic effort in pulling together yet another report card. I'm part of the technical working group and I've seen the rigour and the processes, the technical expertise that goes into this formulation of the report card and to say it's a massive amount of work and a little intense is an understatement, so well done. <laughs> Luke, and uh, we'd like to also uh, thank, through the Mayor, um, the High Regional Council for the time and effort that uh, Luke was able to put in, and the technical working group. But importantly, we'd like to thank Council for its genuine on the ground collaborative actions with different groups. There are councils and then there are councils. If you don't have a council that wants to work with the other groups within the community, then we have stagnation. This we're council still, we're still paid. wondering, Terry, how Luke got three hundred thousand dollars for a fish lake, but he's done pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been another project that you thought was going to be completed. <laughs> 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 just think that it may be now involved in a fish lake. <laughs> you may need to check the title of that project. <laughs> Don't get all the team up. <laughs> right, hello. No, no. We've been there a long. It's an opportunity to have Will Turner and Scott Fry from. North Queensland Dry Topics will be giving speaking to us. Um, North Queensland Dry Topics is a founding member of our partnership. And Donna is the manager of the strategy and partnerships team which works to establish and maintain community and industry alliances to support regional natural resource management delivery in the Burdick and Dry Topics. And Scott is a senior project officer of the Waterways Wetland and Coast team. He has nearly 10 years' experience working with land managers in the Lower Bergen, which includes the northern section of the Don Basin, to deliver projects that protect, conserve, and rehabilitate the wetlands of Lake Bergen. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country and also thank George for his uh, First up is 
Thank you, George. How big is the Thank you. Uh, people say what's that? So we're a natural resource management group. Our goal is to improve our natural resources and that's our water, our land and our animals. And our region, as you can see there, takes up 8% of Queensland. It goes to the uh, takes in Palm Island, the northern section of uh, boundary of Council City Council. Down south to Alpha comes back up, takes in the beautiful Jungler National Park, and down um, south of Arlington up the coast. So it's quite a large area. Um, John Basin is our southern extent along the coast, and um, we've been working in this area for about 17 years. Uh, we achieved the, our outcomes through working with partners, and this is an important partnership that we've been part of since <coughs> so I guess for us, um, it's a bit different from down here, the, it's the dry tropics, so it is, a lot of our rivers are ephemeral, and um, unless they have some natural, um, some artificial uh, work done on them. So the habitats are full, good history for the full part. The Don Basin has often not had a lot of information data in it, and it's really lovely that over the years, since 2014, it has had habitat, and now over, we're into the 2018 report card, we've got water quality. And the picture about the Don is starting to be able to be told. Uh, the Don is often forgotten because to the north, you have the Birkin irrigation area, lots of information, lots of work going on there. To the south, you have beautiful, spectacular with Sundays, where the dawn sometimes feels like a forgotten uh, cousin. So thank you to this partnership. It's because of the partnership that we're getting more data into this area. And the water quality is amazing to be able to get that. Um, back in 2016, a long-term um, water quality uh, monitoring site was put in. In 2017, that was the first um, data came out, it had the Water quality is moderate, and now in 2018, it's gone good. And I'd like to say that because of all the great work we're doing in the area, it's hard to say. But it's also <laughs> because um, the 2017 data had the uh, um, cyclone fairly information. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say the partnership is important. Just reiterate what everybody else has been saying is what I think Kerry said. It's, it's about sharing the knowledge, sharing the understanding, sharing the outcomes. Now I'm going to hand over to Scott because I just want to show this. Um, he's going to um, talk about his project and actually is one of the reasons that we're getting good results. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Right. Thanks for having us along today, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of our uh, reducing burning and sediments project. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the four wetlands we're working on, which is Saltwater Creek, and it's located in the, the bottom here. I don't know if you can see that well. It flows out there into Cape Upstart. Now, Cape Upstart is really important. Um, it has um, extensive seagrass beds. It's um, critical habitat for the Unibombs turtle recreation and for commercial fish species. Now, we have a large number of flatback turtles that nest on the beach, and also a lot of migratory birds that uh, fly down. Um, now the catchment itself um, is highly uh, it's surrounded predominantly by sugarcane, very um, it's probably the lowest extent of our sugarcane. Um, the creek system itself is highly modified, they lift water out of the Burnican River and send it downstream to the customers um, to extract the water out of there. So it used to flow um, what used to be a ephemeral system and now it flows all year round. So the high delta she has changed significantly. So just here's at the front of the um the, 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 I guess the consequences they didn't realise at the time, the unforeseen consequences. Um, basically at the end of the wet um, the creek systems where we should have our shallow um, dry sorry, shallow coastal wetlands, those soils have become completely saturated. So we have permanent water and that's just led for um vegetation <coughs> invasive species. And predominantly it's been typha, which is although a native plant, um, if it doesn't have water in a drying cycle, it dominates these uh, wetlands. 
So what it does is after it, it sits there, um, the material, the old material breaks down really, this is the nutrients, and the bacteria that breaks down that uh, material extracts, uh, gives it the oxygen out from the water. So when we get a big flood hole, so that goes out into the bay, and we get what we do, we get fish kills. So um, this is a widely acknowledged problem, so we're working with a lot of project partners. So in this case, we're working with uh, the lower Burdick and Water, where we're installing automated gates. So with our project, we've got six automated gates going up, up um, on Saltwater Creek. Um, and so basically we're trying to get a balance of the water. So we're holding the water back, so we've um, got the customers get efficient water, but no water is needed in the bottom of the system, so those areas can reinstate the season early and dry out the season once again. Um, on each system, we're, um, for each automated gate, we're installing uh, fishways, some are vertical slot fishways, uh, here we have a rock ramp fishway um, where we're contracting with reach solutions to come up and deal with it. So again, we're extending the partnership now from the client to the bring your expertise up to us. Um, next slide. <coughs> um, we're also focusing on protecting the hands in the right herring areas. So in the, the light, light to green vegetation is prickly acacia. Um, so we're trying to uh, target all the weeds along the creek system. We currently have 14 landholders signed up to control the weeds for the next 10 years. Uh, we're working with Burdick and Shire Council to be doing uh, biosecurity plans for the, the farmers and also good weed advice and um, a herbicide supplement. So we've got most of the farmers along the creek system here doing the work with us and, and target the woody weeds. So that's a pretty good result. Uh, now, the next one, we're Another unforeseen consequence of all the permanent water, we've had infestation of aquatic weeds over the years. So that's a big ongoing problem for us. Um, for years, we've had a riparian management agreement established here. We have 17 farmers who all pay $350 a year. That money is collectively matched by the water board, the council, and also us when the funds available, and that goes into um, controlling these weeds. So it's been a long term, it's been spot spraying. However, there is big lagoons like this where the weeds are just overtaken and dominated. It's just too hard to do anything. So, typically, our primary infestation is water hyacinth, salvinia. Then we get our paragraphs uh, grazing from their banks and coasts and locks it all together. Then we get the typha coming. Here you can see we had, there was an attempt to try and spray it out and loosen it in the flood holes, but it just died um, and the paragraphs are growing back. So, we've had an amphibious excavator in to remove this. Um, now looking at the creek might think it's fairly shallow, but that's actually six meters deep of waterway. Um, now I just wanted to, just a little reference point where the surface water pump is. <coughs> I'll just show a few before photos. So that's what it looked like before we went through, um, and that's what it looks like after. So it was pretty good. We had an amphibious excavator that went in, it went along the broke the, the bind along the bank, and then we used the winds to bring the wind um, the weeds to us and put them out onto the bank. So. Now we can, it's a pretty expensive exercise, cost about $6,000 per hectare. Um, and we we're well aware that in turn, all that good investment can go back quickly. So this is, basically like we've been in the creek, we've stirred a lot with sediment nutrients, we've replaced some and something else is gonna come in. So here we can see we've got salving air coming back in. So we knew this was gonna happen, we weren't concerned, we've contracted with the Burdick and Shire Council to get out. And for the short term, we're gonna be spot spraying these weeds, but long term we want to work with um, so basically they, they do a great job of extracting nutrients from the water and sediment down to the <coughs> system. So we're moving into uh, improving our practice where we can uh, harvest them. So we're um, purchasing a conveyor belt, so a shoreline conveyor like this, for the Burdick and Chai Council so they can improve their um, aquatic weed practices. So you know, with a long term outlook on glyphosate, you know, maybe get phased out, we're trying to actually now work with the weeds we can harvest them and uh, reuse them on uh, sugar cane hayes. Um, so this is just an example of a previous project. Through a lot of our work, we are to uh, attract investment from Evolution Mining, um, where they um, worked with us to harvest or remove the weeds, but then we actually had the budget to trial, cart it away, um, and compost these weeds. Uh, we had a landholder from Bowen, Jamie Gervis, who was very interested in the project, so he, he provided approximately 20 grand for it. He's got the composting and then up here there and then transporting it down to the uh, to Bowen for a few days of culture crops. So long term we want to try and work with a lot of the farmers to actually put that back on the, the cane paddock 
Yeah, so it was really cool. It all fantastic. And potentially look at reducing the harm of synthetic fertilizers around the farm. So we'll give you a little call for that one. Um, just the last slide, um, just showing you know, we did a, uh, a video recently, you can see it on our YouTube clip of all the works we did. Um, it was a pretty cool little video, and that's just us, uh, the partnership we made with other farmers. So again, it's, you know, we have a lot of farmers, they do get a bit of bad uh, street credit a lot of time, we have a lot of people working with us to improve practices, you know, we've got a farmer here doing that, um, work with the World Health and Water Council, we've got everyone sort of involved, like I said, the common enemy, so the leaders and the issues, so yeah, it's just our project to really move into build a partnership, so hopefully we'll see you guys in the future. Um, that's about it, so thank you very much for having us. <laughs>
the incorporation of, of products that they apply into the soil, maximising the uptake by the plant, thereby maximising the retention on the farm. So we have a vested interest in tomorrow based on what we've learnt from yesterday. So please understand that from an industry perspective, history is always a great teacher. As long as we listen, learn from it, and we'll adapt going forward. And the cane growers are continuing to do that with advanced activities happening in Project Catalyst. Also, we have 70% in growing of our growers engaged in one form or another investment, smart cane best management practice program. That doesn't mean we're suddenly changing tomorrow, but we are starting growers on more and more of that evolutionary process. They evolve and change. And no change creates a click of a finger and a result tomorrow. I'm often drawn by the words of Dr. Russell Reichelt, former chairman of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, who said at an open forum, what you do today will not be seen to impact on the reef five years. So it takes that long to get through the system. But the great thing about this partnership is that we've drawn all of the partners together from a cross section of our community. So, and the report cards actually help us improve knowledge in our community. Because the actions that need to be taken are not the actions of one group or one person. The actions are to be taken by everybody. Because if we across our communities do every little thing we can, whether we flush down our sink or wash down our driveway or put on our ground or, or throw into the waterway, um, you know, I, I, I live here in Mackay and we grow a few gardens and we actually have a, 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 my wife and I have a small little mini mart nearby and there's a drain of the waterway which drains off. And I sometimes lament when I walk up there and see that somebody bought a slushing or something and has been discarded or contained into the waterway. So we've got to be able to teach our children and our adults have a greater understanding of everything that we do as an individual than everything we do as a business, as everything we do as groups, than everything we do as a collective community. Because every little thing counts. But what the report card gives us is some solid grounding, some information to work with, and for us to start in three months' time, more importantly, as I think all partners are waiting for. And I know that uh, we are keenly going to see where we go to from there, is the actions and management going forward. Because we can report and gather data to a cows come home. But if we don't plan and act on that data and those reports, and we are just a part of a mountain of information sitting around, gathering dust, and going nowhere. So we look forward to in three months' time to the opportunity to be able to have that management plan going forward. And for the, everybody in this room and for the community to participate in that and where we need to go with it, but also to hold the partnership to account and government to account what we can do with it. So I'd like to thank you all again very, very much for coming here today and for giving of your time and effort and those partners for being part of this. And I'd like to, uh, we're going to have some, a, a slight brunch now. And I think at some stage, Jonathan, you can all just, if you spot Jonathan, he's going to be rallying for a photo at some stage. So um, I don't know when you want to do that, but um, when did you want that? In the next few minutes, so those that are planning on bolting without eating, um, don't. Because <laughs> Jonathan and Charlie and baby are standing in the doorway, so you can't leave because you cannot knock over a mother and child. <laughs> so thank you very, very much again. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone on the team because we partners rely critically on the hard work that happens behind the scenes. And nothing, nothing of this report card would be where it is today without the team effort that quietly happens behind those scenes to make it happen. We read the reports, we all discuss them, and I'm sure that everyone must sit there sometimes, and Charlie would have as well, when we as partners full of knowledge offer up our comment, and they go, mm, yeah, okay, we'll have a look at that as well. And, and it continues to evolve on. Without their efforts, we wouldn't be here today, and uh, it would make life for Julie and Ricky as chair and deputy chair a lot harder. 
So thank you very, very much again, and uh, please for taking the refreshments and watch Jonathan because he's got a keen eye on a photo. Thank you.